In April of 2022, 32-year-old Amber Wells of Bedford, Indiana, was accused of stealing money from a patient she worked for as a home healthcare aide. The victim told police that she had given Wells permission to use her debit card while doing her laundry and picking up some groceries, but that her record showed a $75 withdrawal that couldn't be accounted for. Wells was scheduled to return to the woman's home two days later, but never showed up. When the patient called the woman's employer, they were unable to get a hold of her. Police paid a visit to Wells' home, but she wasn't there. She agreed to meet with officers, but never showed up for the meeting. An arrest warrant was issued, and Wells was subsequently apprehended on the theft charge. The outcome of the case is unclear. Number 20. Nurse in distress, neglected by her colleagues. When Andrea Morris began experiencing some unpleasant symptoms toward the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, she initially thought she might have contracted the novel coronavirus. She alerted her supervisor, Karen Cerner, at the City of Hope Cancer Center in Upland, California, where she worked as a nurse. Her condition deteriorated rapidly as Cerner dialed 911 and told the dispatcher that Morris appeared to be having a seizure. Cerner said that Morris was unconscious and continued mentioning that she was having a seizure while filming the medical emergency with her phone instead of attempting to perform life-saving measures. When Cerner was unable to get a blood pressure reading, she still didn't try CPR. As it turned out, Morris wasn't having a seizure. She was suffering from cardiac arrest and desperately needed to get oxygen into her brain and body as soon as possible. The video Cerner recorded showed that there were as many as seven employees who were aware of the situation and failed to take action as Morris's condition rapidly declined. Life-saving efforts finally began when Morris's friend and fellow nurse Alma Harris arrived at the scene. By then, more than seven minutes had passed, resulting in irreversible damage that rendered Morris paralyzed from the neck down. She spent eight months in the hospital, was forced to sell her home and drain her retirement in order to pay medical bills and is no longer able to work. In April of 2024, Morris went to the media to share her disappointment about her workers' compensation claim being denied. She continues to fight to get her claim approved in hopes that it will help her afford the ongoing medical care she desperately needs. Number 19. Shaitiona Bishop and Jada Harris in April of 2023, a pair of nurses' aides live-streamed themselves taunting and abusing a dementia patient at an elder care facility in Brevard County, Florida. The video quickly caught the attention of nursing home officials who promptly fired 18-year-old Jada Harris and 20-year-old Shaitiona Bishop. Law enforcement also got involved and the women were charged with voyeurism, abuse and neglect of an elderly or disabled adult and other crimes. In the video, the suspects could be seen blocking the victim from entering the bathroom, complaining about having to help her get dressed and calling the victim embarrassing. Harris and Bishop posted bond and were released shortly after their arrests, much to the anger of Sheriff Wayne Ivey, who believes that bail should have been set much higher. Their cases are ongoing. Number 18. Catherine Hudson while working on a stroke unit in the English town of Blackpool in 2017 and 2018, a hospital nurse in her 50s named Catherine Hudson sedated two patients with unprescribed medications and conspired with a co-worker to drug a third patient. Thankfully, none of the patients died from the powerful drugs, but the outcome could have been much worse. Hudson was arrested after a student nurse reported the illegal drug into hospital officials, who passed the information on to law enforcement. The whistleblower told investigators that when Hudson administered an unprescribed sleeping pill to an elderly patient, she made a comment about how the senior citizen had a do not resuscitate order in place and that an autopsy would be unlikely if she died. Group chats between Hudson, fellow nurse Charlotte Wilmot and other colleagues revealed a disturbing culture of abuse. During one conversation, Hudson joked about sedating all the troublemakers and drugging a patient within an inch of her life. Following her arrest, she claimed that the dialogue was just banter and that it didn't reflect any serious intent to cause harm. But her claims of innocence failed to hold up in court, and in 2023, she was sentenced to more than seven years in prison, while Wilmot received a three-year prison sentence. Number 17. Nick Fisher while working as a paramedic for the Colorado Springs Fire Department's crisis response team in November of 2022, Nick Fisher and his co-workers 
responded to a call from the family of a man experiencing a mental health episode. They arrived to find 63-year-old Kevin Dismang, who has a history of schizophrenia, wandering in the street. A police officer ordered Dismang to put his hands in the air and reassured him that he wasn't under arrest, but he failed to follow orders leading to a struggle between him and responding personnel. Fisher employed a restraining technique similar to a chokehold so the officer could handcuff Dismang, and he became unresponsive. Dismang died at the hospital, and the medical examiner concluded that physical restraint contributed to his death. The district attorney declined to pursue criminal charges after an investigation found that the emergency responders were justified in their actions. But Fisher and others, including the police officer who handcuffed Dismang, are now at the center of a lawsuit claiming that they are directly responsible for the troubled man's death. Dismang's family is accusing Fisher of choking him for up to two minutes at the direction of his colleagues and continuing to apply pressure even after Dismang became unresponsive, cutting off the blood and oxygen flow to his brain. The lawsuit further alleges that Fisher stood outside Dismang's hospital room and bragged about taking him down. He's no longer employed with the Colorado Springs Fire Department, but the officer involved remains on the job and has not been disciplined. The outcome of the civil case remains to be seen. Number 16. Jonathan Howard Hayes. Over a month-long period starting in December of 2021, two patients were fatally overdosed with insulin and one nearly died for the same reason at the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. One of the victims who died, Gwen Crawford, had not been prescribed insulin in over a week. The other victim who passed away, Vicki Lingerfeld, wasn't diabetic at all and had never been prescribed insulin. Yet both she and Crawford had received 10 times the standard dose of it shortly before their deaths. Footage from the morning of Crawford's death showed nurse Jonathan Howard Hayes taking a 300-unit vial of insulin. When confronted with the video, Hayes said that he had wasted the vial and disposed of it in a Sharps container. But his claim couldn't be corroborated by the footage. He signed a statement admitting that he may have accidentally given Crawford insulin that was meant for someone else. But when Hayes was also seen taking insulin shortly before Lingerfeld's death, his superiors began to suspect that he had acted intentionally. The evidence was passed on to law enforcement and during the investigation that followed, Hayes was connected to the near death of a patient prior to the deaths of Crawford and Lingerfeld. Just like in the other cases, the surviving patient, Pamela Little, received an overdose of insulin that almost killed her. She told investigators that she was diabetic but didn't normally take insulin and that a male nurse who took care of her had acted sneaky. Little even claimed that Hayes had put a white pill in her IV line, but that he quickly removed it when another nurse entered the room. In addition to his suspicious use of insulin surrounding these incidents, records show that Hayes routinely doled out far more doses of the drug than his co-workers. Further evidence suggested that he may have tampered with records, which means that there's no way of knowing exactly how many people he may have improperly administered insulin to during his employment at the hospital. Following a months-long investigation, Hayes was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. In March of 2024, prosecutors announced their intention to seek the death penalty. The case is ongoing, along with a civil lawsuit filed by Crawford's surviving family members. Number 15. Jamie Lynn Patton When 40-year-old Joey Clips escaped from a secure ward at a state mental hospital in Morganton, North Carolina, in September of 2019, employees were quick to tell investigators about the absconders' unusually friendly relationship with 28-year-old healthcare technician Jamie Lynn Patton. The woman's co-workers described her closeness with Clips as inappropriate leading to suspicions that she aided in his escape. Clips had been court-ordered to receive treatment at the hospital the previous year, after he was found mentally incompetent to stand trial for criminal charges stemming from a police chase. He was accused of ramming several police vehicles with his car and was facing an assault with a deadly weapon charge. Investigators discovered that Patton had called Clips on one of the ward's payphones several times prior to the escape. She had also called a local roadside motel where she and Clips had stayed for three nights following his breakout. 
A front desk employee who had no idea that the couple were wanted by law enforcement told detectives that the pair acted pretty normal and that he would have kicked them out if they had caused a disturbance. By the time police caught up with Patton, she and Clips had separated. She was fired from her job and charged with harboring a fugitive. And Clips was captured in Virginia. The outcome of the case is unclear. Number 14. Will Davis over a seven-month period beginning in June of 2017, patients at Christus Mother Francis Hospital in Tyler, Texas, experienced unexplained complications while recovering from heart surgery. Their condition suddenly destabilized for no apparent reason and at least seven people died despite doctors' best efforts to save them from their mysterious medical episodes. Staff members eventually figured out what was killing the patients by examining their CT scans, which showed that there was air in their brains. After ruling out the likelihood of this happening by accident, doctors concluded that someone had most likely injected oxygen into the patient's arterial lines. Surveillance footage showed one nurse in particular, Will Davis, entering the victim's rooms just minutes before their complications began. During one fatal episode, Davis could be seen calmly standing at a nurse's station while the patient's emergency alarm blared. After he fell under suspicion for causing the deaths, a search of his computer revealed that he had started researching his crimes ahead of time, including the effects of injecting oxygen into someone's medical line. Based on the investigation's findings, Davis was charged with capital murder in connection with the deaths of four patients. Prosecutors declined to charge him for other deaths, but they believed Davis killed at least seven people and attempted to kill four or five others. He was found guilty as charged. In their efforts to secure a death sentence, the state played a jailhouse phone call between Davis and his now ex-wife for the jury. At his ex's urging, Davis admitted that he may have prolonged patients' illnesses so he would continue getting enough overtime to pay his mortgage and bills, but he denied killing anyone on purpose. This was a lie, according to prosecutors, who insisted that Davis killed for the sheer thrill of it. But the recording at least captured an admission of wrongdoing, and it helped to prove the state's case. After deliberating for just two hours, the jury voted in favor of capital punishment and Davis is currently appealing his case from death row. Number 13. Nicholas Connery In July of 2023, a 90-year-old woman caught a man in a paramedic uniform breaking into her house in Rancho Bernardo, California. The intruder claimed he was there to gather more information about the senior citizen's husband, who had been taken to the hospital by ambulance the night before. But the elderly woman was suspicious about the man's reasons for returning to her home and she told him to leave. Later that day, neighbors overheard activity from outside the woman's home while she was at the hospital visiting her husband. They found the same man from earlier and asked what he was doing there and he claimed that he was trying to get into the house because he had left his iPad there. Law enforcement got involved, and the suspect was identified as 43-year-old Nicholas Connery. He was telling the truth about being an EMT who responded to the call about the elderly woman's husband, but he had no valid reason for returning to the residence, leading to the suspicion that he was trying to burglarize the home after casing the home during the previous night's call. During a search of Connery's bedroom at the fire station, police found a piece of paper with the victim's name and address on it. In his possession, they found a drug called Suboxone, which is used to treat opioid addiction. Connery reportedly admitted that he had been struggling with addiction and that he had recently shown up to work intoxicated. Additional searches of his vehicle and property turned up bottles of medication with other people's names on them, along with guns, ammunition, and equipment for making untraceable ghost guns. Prosecutors charged Connery with various crimes in connection with 10 victims, including burglary, identity theft, possession of assault weapons, and drug possession. He initially maintained his innocence but took a plea deal in early 2024 and is serving a four-year prison sentence for the assault weapon and identity theft charges, along with one count of possessing other people's personal information. Number 12. Heather Presti In late 2023, Pennsylvania state prosecutors charged 41-year-old registered nurse Heather Presti with dozens of crimes for fatally overdosing at least two patients with insulin and attempting to kill several others. Presti fell under suspicion after a victim's relative reported 
seeing her improperly administering insulin to the patient. Further investigation revealed that she gave the deadly injections while working the overnight shift over a three-year period starting in 2020. The patient she was accused of killing consists of a 55-year-old man who died in December of 2022, an 83-year-old man who died several weeks later, and a 73-year-old man who survived after being rushed to the hospital. Only one of the three patients was prescribed insulin, the other two were not even diabetic. Presti was originally charged with two counts of first-degree murder, 17 counts of attempted murder, and 19 counts of neglect of a care-dependent person. According to prosecutors, 17 patients ranging in age from 43 to 104 years old died under Presti's care, but her history of questionable workplace behavior dates back even further than the time period encompassing her criminal charges. Between 2018 and 2023, she worked for 11 different employers due to a pattern of quitting or being fired due to conflicts with co-workers and patients. And according to court documents, she sent her mother frustrated text messages on numerous occasions, stating that she wanted to harm colleagues, patients, and others who were frustrating her. During questioning, Prestia reportedly told investigators that she thought her victims would be better off dead. She admitted to overdosing several patients with insulin and deliberately failing to seek help as their conditions descended into life-threatening medical emergencies in order to avoid the death penalty. Presti pleaded guilty to three counts of first-degree murder and 19 counts of criminal attempt to commit murder. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 11. Gwendolyn Peachy Vick While working at the Warpen Correctional Institution in Dodge County, Wisconsin in late 2023, Nurse Gwendolyn Peachy Vick was accused of ignoring an inmate's dire need for emergency medical care, thereby playing a direct role in his death. 24-year-old Cameron Williams begged for help for weeks leading up to his death from a rear stroke, only to be continuously ignored by certain staff members while in an obvious state of suffering. During his last week alive, Williams was seen twice for nausea and vomiting. He was also scheduled for an x-ray, which was cancelled for unexplained reasons. A week after the cancelled appointment, an employee saw him lying next to the toilet in his cell. His breathing was laboured, and still no emergency care was sought. Four hours later, Williams was found unresponsive by a corrections officer, who relayed the discovery to another CO before clocking out at the end of her shift. The information was passed on to Vic, who determined that it was not medically necessary to enter the inmate's cell or intervene in any way. She described Williams as a frequent flyer, implying that he was known for making excessive medical requests. Vic seemed to think that Williams was trying to get out of jail. By the time medical staff paid meaningful attention to the inmate's condition the following morning, it was too late to save Williams. Following an investigation into his death, authorities charged Vic with one felony count of abuse of residents of penal facilities. She pleaded not guilty and remains free as her case works its way through the court system. Number 10. Kathy Wood and Gwendolyn Graham In October of 1988, police in Walker, Michigan, received a shocking tip from a man named Ken Wood, who claimed that his ex-wife, Kathy Wood, had confessed to murdering five patients at the nursing home where she worked as a nurse's aide with help from her co-worker and lover, Gwendolyn Graham. Contrary to Ken's claims, Kathy Wood was considered an excellent employee at her workplace. Detectives nevertheless questioned her and confronted her with Ken's allegations. At first, Kathy denied any wrongdoing, but as law enforcement dialed up the pressure, she began to make small admissions. Based on Kathy's version of events, she and Gwendolyn had met at work two years earlier in 1986. Their friendship quickly evolved into a love affair. The first murder occurred in January of 1987 when, according to Kathy, Gwendolyn smothered an Alzheimer's patient with a washcloth while Kathy acted as a lookout. Because there were no outward signs of foul play, the patient's death was ruled as natural. Kathy and Gwendolyn claimed four more victims over the next several months. The victims, who ranged in age from 65 to 97, included incapacitated patients who were completely incapable of defending themselves. Kathy claimed that Gwendolyn was both the mastermind and the actual killer in all five murders. She failed to offer no substantial motive for the killings beyond claiming that 
Gwendolyn got an erotic thrill out of doing it. She also said that the murder cemented her bond with Gwendolyn by giving the couple a deep, dark secret that they believed would prevent one another from leaving the relationship. The women made a game out of their twisted killing campaign, choosing each of their victims based on their initials in hopes of spelling out the word murder. Kathy was charged with two counts of open murder while Gwendolyn faced five counts of first degree murder. By then they had broken up, leading to suspicions that Kathy was placing a disproportionate amount of the blame for the murders on Gwendolyn. She failed the polygraph test and eventually confessed to playing a bigger role in the crimes than she had originally admitted to. Despite this admission, Kathy's cooperation in the case against Gwendolyn landed her a generous plea deal which resulted in a 20 to 40 year federal prison sentence in exchange for pleading guilty to one count of second degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Gwendolyn Graham was convicted of all the five murder charges and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. She received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Kathy was released in 2020 and it remains widely speculated that she was more involved in the murders than she ever admitted to and that she blamed Gwendolyn out of revenge for ending their relationship. Number 9. Rehan Moreira Teish 23-year-old aspiring nurse Rehan Moreira Teish was just three days into her training at a medical clinic in Rio de Janeiro when she accidentally killed an 80-year-old woman in 2012. The career-destroying mistake came when Teish accidentally injected Palmarina Perez Ribeiro's IV line with a serving of milk and coffee that was meant for her feeding tube. It went straight to the patient's heart and lungs, cutting off her oxygen supply and killing her within hours. As a result, Moriera Teesh and three other staff members were charged with involuntary manslaughter. In addition to living with the mental trauma of knowing that she killed someone, Moriera Teesh had to grapple with the horrifying realization that Perez Ribeiro's death was neither quick nor painless. According to nutritional specialist Dr. Armando Carrero, who appeared on the Brazilian talk show Fantastico in the wake of the tragedy, the victim would have felt like she was suffocating. Moriera Teesh told the show that she was aware of the dangers of injecting food into an IV line, but claimed that it was easy to get the feed in tube and IV line mixed up because they were right next to each other. Dr. Carrero disagreed with this claim, describing the IV and feed in tube as quite easy to differentiate one from the other. Furthermore, Moriera Teesh accused the trainer of sitting around and playing on her phone instead of showing her and another intern how to properly inject the food into the feeding tube. Dr. Carrero agreed that the interns were probably told to administer the food, but he said that they were probably also instructed not to do anything without proper supervision. The nursing instructor who oversaw Moriera Teesh outside of the internship described her as an excellent student. For that reason, she was allowed to continue her training as her criminal case proceeded through the court system. The outcome is unclear. Number 8. Yasmin Tolbert In January of 2024, a 48-year-old jail nurse named Yasmin Tolbert was accused of smuggling a razor blade into the Nassau County Correctional Center in Long Island, New York, for an inmate she was having an unauthorized relationship with. According to prosecutors, Tolbert also provided her illicit lover with confidential information, including the specific locations of other inmates and put money on his commissary using an alias. At the time of her arrest, Tolbert was the second highest ranking nurse at the jail. According to investigators, her unauthorized relationship with inmate Christopher Wright lasted from January to May of 2023. As part of her job, Tolbert was allowed to have limited interactions with inmates, but she was not allowed to engage them or their families in conversation and was banned from doing them any sort of favors, including bringing things into the facility for them. Despite these rules, Talbot allegedly spoke with Wright on several occasions about obtaining a certain type of razor, which she then ordered from Amazon. She handed the weapon off to Wright after he was brought to medical in response to a complaint about chest pain. Following her arrest, Talbot was indicted on numerous charges that could result in a years-long prison sentence, including promoting prison contraband, offering a false instrument for filing, falsifying business records, official misconduct, and conspiracy. 
She pleaded not guilty and remains free on bail amid the ongoing case. Number seven, Peter Cadigan and Peggy Finley. In December of 2022, police in Springfield, Illinois, responded to the home of 35-year-old Earl Moore Jr., who was suffering severe alcohol withdrawal after going four days without drinking. Moore was in obvious distress as he lay in bed hallucinating, unable to answer basic questions like what year it was. He experienced fleeting moments of clarity but for the most part was incoherent and in extreme discomfort. By the time EMT Peggy Finley arrived, Moore was on the floor writhing in agony but Finley showed no mercy in police body cam footage and could be heard repeatedly ordering Moore to stand up. She also told the anguished patient to quit acting stupid and refused to help him out of the house and into the ambulance, threatening to leave him behind if he didn't get up and walk on his own. Moore fell repeatedly as police officers helped him to the ambulance where Finley and another EMT, Peter Cadigan, strapped him face down onto a stretcher. By the time he arrived at the hospital, he was unresponsive. Attempts to resuscitate Moore failed, and the medical examiner concluded that he had suffocated to death after being improperly secured to the stretcher. His death was ruled a homicide, and Finley and Callaghan were charged with first-degree murder. According to prosecutors, the defendants failed to take Moore's vitals during the ambulance ride, which would have likely alerted them to the fact that he was having a life-threatening medical emergency and given them time to save his life. They pleaded not guilty and are due back in court in August of 2024. In addition to the criminal charges, Finley and Cadigan are named in a wrongful death lawsuit by Moore's surviving family members. Both cases are ongoing. Number 6. Kimberly Clark Sayens After being fired from four previous healthcare jobs, licensed vocational nurse Kimberly Clark Sayens landed work at a dialysis clinic in Lufkin, Texas. In addition to her checkered work history, she had a history of substance abuse, which included past criminal charges, but these details, along with any other signs that she might be an unstable employee, fell through the cracks of the clinic's vetting system. During the spring of 2008, a suspiciously high number of patients at the clinic fell gravely ill in the month of April alone. Paramedics were called to the address 30 times, which is more than twice the amount of calls that they responded to at the facility throughout the entire previous year. At least one woman landed in the emergency room repeatedly after receiving too much heparin blood thinner, while other patients unexplainably suffered cardiac arrest. This uptick in medical emergencies did not go unnoticed, and after two patients died, the clinic increased its administrative oversight. But the mysterious ailments continued and responding EMTs addressed their growing concerns with their superiors, resulting in an anonymous phone call to the local health department. Around the same time, witnesses accused Sayens of injecting patients' dialysis lines with bleach. A co-worker told investigators that the suspected serial killer had expressed a dislike for patients who had all experienced sudden medical emergencies, including some who died. Another employee accused Sayens of smoking a cigarette and refusing to help when a patient she had just interacted with coded. An expert chemist determined abnormalities in several victims' blood samples, which could only be explained by the presence of bleach. In a process known as hemolysis, the bleach had caused the patient's red blood cells to explode and release iron, leading to cardiac arrest and in some cases death. Sayens denied the allegations but was fired lost her nursing license and was charged with five counts of capital murder and five counts of aggravated assault. She was convicted, as charged, in 2012 and received five life sentences, despite prosecutors' attempts to send her to death row. Number 5. Jeremy Cooper and Peter Sichinayak While walking home from a convenience store in Aurora, Colorado. In August of 2019, 23-year-old Elijah McLean crossed paths with police officers who were searching for a sketchy-looking unarmed suspect who was wearing a mask. During the confrontation, the officers restrained McLean using a type of chokehold called a carotid hold, which is designed to render a suspect unconscious. McLean vomited several times while repeatedly apologizing to the police, saying that he couldn't breathe correctly. Paramedics Jeremy Cooper and Peter Sichonayak 
were called to the scene where they injected McLean with a large dose of a powerful sedative called ketamine. McLean went into cardiac arrest while en route to the hospital and died a few days later. His initial autopsy was inconclusive, but an amended report listed the young man's cause of death as complications of ketamine administration following forcible restraint. In September of 2021, Cooper, Sitchanayak, and officers Nathan Woodyard, Jason Rosenblatt, and Randy Rodema were charged with manslaughter in connection with McLean's death. According to prosecutors, the officers did not have a legal basis to stop or detain McLean, while Cooper and Sitchanayak were accused of administering an overdose of ketamine. Officers Rosenblatt and Woodyard were acquitted of all charges, while Rodema was found guilty of criminally negligent homicide and assault, resulting in a 14-month jail sentence. Both Cooper and Sitchanayak were convicted of negligent homicide. Sitchanayak, who injected McLean with the ketamine, was sentenced to five years in prison, while Cooper received a four-year probation sentence. Because all of the officers at the scene claimed that their body cameras were knocked off during the struggle with McLean, questions about exactly what happened that night continue to surround the case. Number four, Charles Cullen. Nobody knows when nurse Charles Cullen began murdering patients or how many people he killed. He took the life of his first known victim in 1988 while working at a hospital in Livingston, New Jersey, where he injected a judge with a deadly dose of medication. At the time, Cullen was entangled in the throes of alcoholism, mental illness, and a failing marriage. While it's unclear if these issues triggered him to start killing, this downward spiral seemed to coincide with the murders he committed over the next four years. Cullen is thought to have killed dozens of victims. He left the hospital in 1992 after investigators discovered that patients' IV bags had been contaminated with insulin and other medications that they were not supposed to receive. About a month later, Cullen took a job at a hospital in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, where he fatally overdosed three elderly women with the heart medication digoxin. During her dying moments, one of the patients accused a sneaky male nurse of tampering with her IV, but her concerns were brushed off. Cullen's personal life derailed even further in 1993 with an acrimonious divorce, a two-month stay at a psychiatric hospital, and a criminal case for stalking a female co-worker. During that same year, the son of one of Cullen's victims reported his late mother's claims of a male nurse tampering with her IV. An investigation was launched, but Cullen passed the lie detector test and was thereby absolved of any wrongdoing. He continued to find jobs and kill patients, despite his ailing mental health and questionable personal life, and managed to fly under the radar until the death of his final victim in 2003 in Somerville, New Jersey. Cullen was finally caught after his co-workers noticed him hanging out in rooms he wasn't assigned to, ordering drugs for patients they weren't prescribed to, and going through patient records that he had no reason to look at. Following his arrest, he confessed to killing at least 40 other patients over a 16-year period, with some estimates placing his number of victims as high as 400. Prosecutors agreed not to pursue the death penalty in exchange for Cullen's help identify more victims. He was sentenced to 18 consecutive life terms but was never required to explain why he committed the murders, leaving his motives shrouded in mystery to this day. Number 3. Daniel Duffield in late June of 2024, 22-year-old psychiatric nurse Lauren Evans and her boyfriend, 24-year-old paramedic Daniel Duffield, were found dead by their colleagues at a residence in Staffordshire, England. Evans had recently graduated college and was just starting her career while Duffield was featured on the docuseries 999 on the front line, which showcases ambulances crews in the country's West Midlands. Authorities have not revealed the cause of death, but they are treating Evans's death as a murder and are not searching for any suspects. Indicating that they have a good idea of what happened, they've called on anyone with information that can help shed light on the situation to come forward. An inquest was opened, but the findings have yet to be revealed. In the meantime, all episodes of On the Frontline featuring Duffield have been pulled from the air. Today's topic was requested by Reed December 5372, Hugo Heather, and Lovieta Hislop 1815. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Redonda Fort, former nurse, 
Redonda Vaught, was in her early 30s when she landed a job at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, one of the most respected hospitals in the United States. In 2015, her career came to an unexpected end just two years later after she accidentally gave paralyzing medication to 75-year-old Charlene Murphy, who had checked into the hospital a few days earlier and was almost well enough to go home. Vaught was instructed to give Murphy a sedative called Versed, but she unintentionally grabbed the medication next to it, Vecaronium, from a cabinet where medications were being stored. She administered the injection without double-checking the label and Murphy died later that day. Vaught admitted the error to her superiors who fired her and took steps to conceal the mistake. They failed to report the deadly mix-up to state or federal authorities as required by law, and Murphy's death was ruled natural. A few months later, in early 2018, Murphy's family was banned from speaking publicly about the incident as part of an out-of-court settlement with Vanderbilt. Later that year, an anonymous tipster reported the medication mix-up to the federal government. Knowledge of the case became public shortly thereafter, and in early 2019, Vaught was charged with reckless homicide. A jury found her guilty of the lesser charge of criminally negligent homicide, and she was sentenced to three years of probation. She was given the opportunity to eventually have her record expunged, but is permanently banned from working in healthcare. The controversial case garnered an outpouring of support from sympathetic healthcare workers and nationally recognized nursing groups who feared that Vaught's fate would pave the way for the criminalization of nurses for honest mistakes. On the other hand, the victim's widow felt as though Vaught received a slap on the wrist and that she deserved the maximum punishment of six years in prison. If you thought these atrocious health workers weren't disturbing enough, wait till you see the vein getting their proper punishments in our previous release of When Narcissistic People Go On Power Trips, coming up right after number one. Number one, Amanda Goodwin. In November of 2016, 27-year-old Amanda Goodwin of Hendersonville, Tennessee, was accused of fraudulently writing prescriptions for herself using the names of at least two doctors without their knowledge and consent, according to news reports. She used the phony prescriptions to obtain Tylenol with codeine, one a month over a five-month period. As a certified medical assistant, Goodwin had access to computer software that would have enabled her to send the prescriptions. She was held in custody with bail set at $5,000 as she awaited her next court date. The outcome of the case is unclear. Number 8. Rhett Carty Shaw in Kayoro Mori Akiro When 17-year-old Kayoro Mori Akiro discovered that her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Rhett Carty Shaw, also 17, was still seeing his ex behind her back. She began pushing him to prove his loyalty. Akiro stated she felt humiliated and betrayed, and the only solution would be to get rid of his ex. In May 2019, Carty Shaw visited his former lover, Imar Nasir, in her house in Oppenshaw, Greater Manchester, England. The young woman had just given birth to their child only two months before. After having been intimate with Nasir, Carty Shaw pulled out a knife and stabbed her repeatedly in the face and neck, while also beating her savagely. Meanwhile, Akira kept control of the situation from afar, texting her boyfriend over 50 times, demanding he filmed the attack. He left Nasir for dead, letting his girlfriend know that he had gone through with their plan, stating, I did it to prove I love you. Nasir somehow survived the attack and had to be hospitalized for four days while requiring multiple surgeries. She testified against the peer in court, explaining the injuries made it impossible for her to pick up her own baby and talking about the emotional and physical damage the attack had caused her. On December 20th, 2019, Carty Shaw and Mori Akiro were each convicted to 16 years in prison for attempted murder and intentionally assisting a person to commit murder, respectively. Number seven. Julio Garay. On July the 14th, 2020, Julio Garay ambushed and murdered his estranged wife on her way to a doctor's appointment in Camarena Health Center in Madeira, California. Callie Jean Garay had recently gotten a restraining order against her husband. It was after seven long years of abuse, being subjected to attacks with screwdrivers, fire pokers, 
chainsaw blades, and any other household object at hand, that she finally escaped the marriage along with their three kids with only $19 in her pocket. On the day of the murder, Garay approached Callie Jean and their three children and started shooting at them before they could find refuge. She died at the scene, trying to keep the boys from harm, using her body as a shield. Dale Blear, the case's preceding judge, referred to the defendant as a self-absorbed narcissist who appeared laser-focused on destroying everything that was important to Callie. 50-year-old Garay was found guilty of first-degree murder and three counts of child abuse on November the 17th, 2021. Given the charges, the only possible sentence was life without the possibility of parole. Soon after the trial, California passed Callie's law, meant to ensure victims of domestic abuse are granted the same protection rights that could have saved the mother of three's life. Number 6. Jessica Smith 40-year-old mother of two Jessica Smith showed no regrets while addressing the court, accused of murdering her toddler and harming her 13-year-old daughter. On August 17, 2016, Smith and her husband had been involved in a custody dispute back in 2014 when the attack took place. The family court judge had ordered a one-day visitation regime in favor of the father, but Jessica refused to give the children over to her ex, taking them to a motel in Cannon Beach, Oregon instead. Smith claimed her kids were terrified of their father and that her daughter, Alana, told her she'd rather be dead than live with him. On July 31st, 2014, Smith attacked both her own children, with only Alana surviving the ordeal. When police finally caught up with Smith, they found that she had been living out of her car and was trying to starve herself. It took two more years for her to be convicted for her crimes. She opted to enter an Alford plea, in which the defendant maintains their innocence while admitting that there is enough evidence to find them guilty. Smith was sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 40 years served. Number 5. Kyle Overmeyer Former Sandusky County Sheriff Kyle Overmeyer was branded a narcissist by Judge Patricia Cosgrove, who officiated over his 2016 trial. Overmeyer was accused of taking advantage of his office for his own benefit, using public funds to finance family vacations, meals, and his own re-election campaign. He also had developed an addiction to painkillers, and though he was prescribed over a thousand pills over a two-year period, he still tried to find illegal ways to feed his needs. Overmeyer began to steal discarded drug take-back boxes from four different police departments under his command. Of the 43 charges he was indicted with, he pleaded guilty to 13 felony counts. On November the 22nd, 2016, Overmeyer sobbed as he admitted to his crimes, asking to be allowed to go into rehab in lieu of a stricter sentence. Judge Cosgrove didn't believe his remorse and rejected his plea for mercy. As well as being sentenced to four years in prison, Overmeyer was forced to use his state retirement pension to pay the state a restitution of $24,000. Overmeyer was released in April 2022, spending the last 180 days of his sentence in a halfway house. Number 4. Ian Stewart Using what's known in psychology as cognitive distortion, murderer Ian Stewart was able to carry on with his life as usual after assassinating not one, but two romantic partners, allowing him to avoid suspicion for over six years. On June 25, 2010, Stewart murdered his wife Diana at their home in Basingbourne, England. The death was considered accidental in part due to her husband's 999 call, in which he claimed to have discovered Diana lying unconscious in their back garden. His wife, he explained, had a history of epilepsy. It was only after he drugged and suffocated his new fiance, acclaimed author Helen Bailey, in 2016 that police took a closer look at Diana's death. Already serving a life sentence for Bailey's assassination, Stewart allegedly asked investigators, haven't you got anything better to do? Though his first wife's body had been cremated, Stewart, at the time, had decided to donate Diana's brain to science. It had been adequately preserved for six years, making an autopsy of the organ possible. The inspection led medical examiners to change the cause of death to prolonged restriction to her breathing from an outside source. Psychologists connected with the case theorized Stewart had narcissistic tendencies and viewed the women in his life as means to an end. 
The motive behind both murders was monetary. First, the defendant received £100,000 after his wife's death and he stood to inherit £4 million from Helen's estate. Number 3. The Murder of Grace Millane British marketing graduate Grace Millane went missing in Auckland on December 1, 2018 while backpacking in New Zealand. It was the day before her 22nd birthday and she had planned to celebrate by going on a date with Jesse Kempson, a man she'd met on Tinder. The family grew concerned after not receiving a response to their happy birthday messages. Two days after her disappearance, they contacted the Auckland police, who launched an investigation. Her body would be recovered eight days later, stuffed into a suitcase in a fetal position. Investigators zeroed in on Kempson as their main suspect after discovering a post on her Facebook page and realizing that he was probably the last person to have been in contact with Millane. After being confronted with CCTV videos of himself wheeling the suitcase out of a hotel lobby, Kempson confessed to the murder. He told investigators that he had purchased the bag after the crime and had abandoned it in Waitakere Ranges, a mountainous region west of Auckland. The trial lasted only three weeks and the prosecution called several witnesses to the stand, all of which portrayed Kempson as a narcissistic, compulsive liar who had alienated himself from family and friends, who was obsessed with dating as many women as possible. He had rused Tinder dates into believing he had cancer had been adopted and neglected as a child and even that he was friends with several celebrities. Finally, in February 2020, he was convicted to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 17 years. On November 2, 2016, California resident Sherry Papini disappeared while out jogging. Local authorities contacted the FBI and a search party was assembled. She reappeared 22 days later, 150 miles south of her home claiming to have been kidnapped by two Hispanic men. The mother of two seemed to be hurt and in shock as she gave her statement. Authorities, though, noticed inconsistencies in her story, and an investigation led them to discover Papini had run away to live with her ex-boyfriend. Police also found all of her wounds to have been self-inflicted. For six years, the investigation continued, with multiple interrogations being conducted by both the police and FBI. Papini maintained her version of events, even after being warned that lying to the FBI was considered a federal offense. She went as far as to apply for monetary benefits and received over $30,000 from the California Victims' Compensation Board. Finally, in March 2022, Papini was arrested, pleading guilty to mail fraud and making a false statement to federal agents. She claimed to be ashamed of her behavior and issued a public apology, but County Sheriff Michael L. Johnson who was involved in the investigation from the start, denied this was the case. Johnson called Papini out for her behavior, stating the case was about some very strong, narcissistic behavior, along with deception, deceit, and selfishness, and that her confession and supplementary apology was the result of a plea deal offered by the state. Thanks for watching. If you could choose, would you rather become the top brain surgeon in your country overnight or land one of the lead roles in Grey's Anatomy?